Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. My name is Bookie Youssef and amongst a number of different things I actually do, I'm a, a part-time uh, teacher, senior leader um, and science lead at Edith K School and what I'm going to do is just give a summary of um, EdTech perspectives with regards to alternative provision. So for those of you that are not familiar um, with alternative provision, there are actually two definitions. So in 2013, the DfV actually said, describe alternative provision as any educational setup that enabled students who are excluded for a variety of reasons, it could have been illness, maybe behavior, for them to actually continue with their education um, as part of their offsite provision. This was more recently updated in 2021 to say that alternative provision basically is the educational setup for students who are not able to be in a mainstream or special school setting. And again, just to give you a bit more context about the type of students we talk about um, that actually is linked to, a high number of them have special educational needs, complex learning needs, um, classified as having free school meals, and also um, in terms of their ethnicity, there's a high proportion as you can actually see that's actually listed. So it may give you an idea about the students who typically are excluded for a want of a better expression from mainstream uh, schooling setup. And from a gender perspective, um, I shared the statistics that were shared in very recently in, uh, by the DfE, just to give you an outline about, uh, in terms of gender, the number of um, young people that we have, male and female there. And helpfully, they didn't actually describe what other meant, but uh, it gives you a context that predominantly we have a lot of boys in there. So with that regard, my school context, as I say, it's a special school. Um, and also from the older definition, it's also a 20 provision. All of the students that we have within our setup have not been in school for um, approximately, say, 10 months, some even longer than that. And all our students are aged from 14 to 19. So I'm gonna just uh, zip through our experience with COVID, the pandemic, and it, how it impacted upon the educational provision we provided. So in 2020, we obviously, like the rest of the world, went on to online education, and we managed quite successfully. The additional challenge, however, was when we actually had to undertake uh, blended learning with the most recent lockdown within England. So blended learning basically meant that we had to um, put our remote learning plan into place alongside our face-to-face -face teaching and that actually posed a number of new challenges you know for staff as well as students and the families but as always we last year as well as this year we spoke to families it's really important for us in able to uh, support the young people and ensure that they're successful in their educational outcomes to have robust um, and open communication with families just asking how they are how things are going before we look at the technology. Now, it's really important in terms of um, the emotional health um, and mental well-being, just to say that we are here to support you. And I think that's something I've always shared about my school, that, that, the fact that we're here to support you and then look at what we can actually do for the education aspects. We did, we posed those questions last year as well as this year, because we didn't want to make any assumptions about the technology or IT provision at home. What we found out is that, un not unusual to many other students, a lot of students learnt through their mobile devices. And so through um, the government scheme, we were able to make sure that every student actually had a, a laptop to do their online learning with, um, and that we actually taught them how to use the laptop for their lessons. We made no assumptions. It also meant that um, staff had to learn as well. So. I've shared this before last year and the fact that so staff rose to the challenge in making sure they were actually able to teach in a different context through various platforms they were not familiar with. We also use WhatsApp for um, the practical lessons. So food, cooking, art, uh, where it wasn't always easy to share the teaching strategies online through the laptop. We actually have the videos to going with the young person. They had their parents, carers or guardian also in the lesson just to facilitate the learning. Now, we found, unsurprisingly, that many of our students loved the remote learning setup. It reduced their anxieties, but they became really independent learners who took charge of their learning. It helped accelerate prayer progress and led to higher engagement levels, but not every student found that 
we still recognise and found that particularly with STEM students, a lot of them were not able to engage with this way of particularly learning. So we're now moving to using Loom, which I know a lot of educators around the world are actually doing. So where the students find it difficult to come online as part of our asynchronous setup, we have the learning resources there and they can actually see us because we recognize that uh, that connection and the continuity of the relationship and ensuring them that we are there to support them to do the best they possibly can do. We also had to make sure that our marking and feedback strategies worked well within the um, classroom setup as well as online. And we just kept it very, very simple, F focusing upon uh, what works well, aspects they needed to improve and specific actions to implement. Not all of that feedback necessarily has to be in writing. Sometimes it might be kept all, um, it might be what we just give to them verbally or caught in an audible sense, but it gives them specific guidelines to actually help them move on and to progress. Now, my very wise head teacher made us realize about the fact that in order for our um, distance learning, our blended learning approach to be as well as it could possibly be, we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves in order to be in a good position to take care of our students. And she's always had a focus upon our mo mental health and well-being. So last year, um, we had a lot of time spent uh, with daily briefings, staff updates, staff discussions. And we use a, ver a variety of ways of ensuring that we were continuing as a school community with regards to staff, with the WhatsApp group, Zoom meetings and phone calls, but also with the young people to make sure that even if they weren't engaging with lessons, we knew that they were okay and they knew that we were there with their families and also um, external services as well, because a lot of our young students have those services as part of the setup. So with the Zoom meetings last year, well-being focused on a Friday, a lot of fun. You know, we had quizzes, showing art, just talking about how we were actually feeling. But what we found was, as fun as it was, it wasn't necessarily sustainable. The, the lockdown down we're experiencing again within England, it's much more challenging. It's in the winter. You know, it's colder, it's darker. The novelty of all the great things of, you know, the cooking and, you know, the fun ways of actually engaging online has worn off. So we found that we actually had to um, undertake some relaxation techniques. And one of them is actually taking place later on today where staff get together. We have a colleague that actually leads us and gives us practical strategies. Now, the advantage we found by doing an remote setup is the fact that you don't have to show yourself. You can actually just listen. So if you want to have your audio and your video off, you can still engage. But it also enables those of us that have uh, young children at home or students, you know, children who are actually learning as well as part of their online learning can also join it in. But these are specific relaxation techniques as part of a way of helping us by us staff, as well as our young students to um, uh, emotionally regulate and deal with any challenges that we feel. So as I say, we recognize um, alongside, and I think it's been mentioned again, about student uh, mental health and well-being. And in our case, there are many different aspects that actually come into it, not just the cognitive in terms of what they're actually learning, but the psychological, the social. That's the reason why, um, as challenging as it has been, I'll be honest, keeping the school open was the best decision to do. We're in smaller bubbles, we go in on a part-time basis, but it enables us to actually touch base with students, and it's part of their emotional health and well-being and self-regulation. We also have um, additional support. So for example, tra trauma um, informed um, practices to help students that require that, as well as speech and language therapies as well. So that actually aids in terms of their well-being as well. But we've recognized from this experience of what we experienced last year and this year that there are key priorities of maintaining relationships, ensuring that there is high quality teaching and learning and that there is curriculum continuity because in the pathways we actually undertake, remote learning will still need to continue for the traditional journeys where students undertake home learning if they find it challenging to come onto the school sites. It links in with what Gavin Williamson wants in terms of making sure that we continue with the skills and learnings we've actually undertaken. Oops, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> but looking to the future very quickly, they, we must, we must ensure that we continue with accessibility, that we ensure that students can actually touch type or at least increase their typing speeds if they're going to be continuing to work in a digital sense. 
They have to have transferable digital skills that go beyond the school walls and that we have to make most of the virtual work experience as the pandemic continues. Thank you very much.